Welcome to Strategy Talk, where the editors of Strategy Page discuss current events with a splash of history. I'm Dan Masterson, host of Strategy Talk. With me today is the editor of Strategy Page, well-known military author and game designer, Jim Dunnigan. Also joining us is the associate editor of Strategy Page, columnist and author, Austin Bay. Welcome, Austin and Jim. Jim, what is Putin and the rest of Russia going to do now with Ukraine? They're just sort of stuck there, and it's turned out to be quite a mess for them. Where do they go from here? Well, Putin has made several uh, declarations of what his intentions are. Uh, The current ones are to uh, not worry. Uh, That's what he basically tells the uh, the Russian people, that, um, that he has a new plan. And uh, it involves um, uh, basically encouraging uh, some of the NATO powers to uh, to pressure uh, Zelensky in Ukraine uh, to negotiate. Uh, he's basically saying, you know, to his to Russians and implying, you know, to the uh, to the rest of the world that he is in no way going to give up, you know, the territory he has in Ukraine. And that uh, even though, and he won't admit this, he hasn't got the manpower. They're having, uh, they're having, you know, uh, enormous problems uh, getting troops, especially uh, trained troops, um, to uh, fight uh, in uh, in Ukraine. For example, he recently uh, relieved the commander of the uh, airborne forces, the Russian airborne forces, for poor leadership. Now, the airborne forces the units committed. Uh, to Ukraine have taken enormous casualties. They are among the more aggressive of the Russian forces. They are they are skilled. They are um, they are professionals, and uh, they have basically followed orders. And any progress, all the progress that the uh, that the Russians have made, has been done at the expense of the airborne forces, who have taken heavy casualties in the process. Now Putin uh, knows that this news is getting back to Russia. Uh, they can't hide all the, the uh, how should I put it, the dead bodies, uh, especially the ones that parents, well, let me put it this way. Parents are asking embarrassing questions. They haven't heard from their sons for months. Uh, last they heard, they were headed for Ukraine or they were in Ukraine. And um, uh, the, Russia has no official answer. In fact, it's illegal to openly discuss you know, casualties in uh, Ukraine. But this is a serious problem because one thing that was obvious to everybody who studied, you know, uh, Russia's uh, development since 1991, since the Soviet Union broke up, was that one of the things the new uh, Russian government democracy uh, wanted was less conscription. Now, they couldn't eliminate conscription. Putin made a made a uh, promise when he took power in uh, 20, 20 some years ago uh, that they would end uh, a conscription. He would improve the economy, which he did for a while, and that eventually they could afford to depend on contract soldiers. That is what the West calls, you know, uh, volunteers who are paid at a higher rate and uh, are kept in the military longer. Well, that didn't work out. Uh, the uh, The economy tanked. He basically invaded uh, Ukraine grab Crimea and part of, you know, the Donbass, uh, and more sanctions followed. The economy continues to tank, and he definitely hasn't got any money now. Uh, it, it, made, it got worse when a lot of the contract soldiers uh, refused to renew their contracts. And some of them uh, who had uh, still had, you know, civil under contract, they refused to go back to Ukraine because it wasn't an official invasion. In other words, Putin still insists on calling it a special operation to reunite uh, uh, U- uh, Ukraine uh, with Mother Russia. Uh, and if he, if he declares a state of war, he basically you know, puts a lie to that. And he, it, his polls, I mean, they, they have uh, uh, opinion polls usually conducted by the reliable ones. We don't really find out about until much later. But one of the duties of the FSB, you know, the former KGB, is to uh, is to contact their, their informants, as it were, all over Russia, uh, to uh, covertly, you know, covertly uh, uh, report on the, uh, the attitudes of the people in that area. 
these uh, these these informants are you know kept secret. They because they could face retribution if they were found to be uh, working for the FSB. And so Putin knows that declaring war uh, will cause more unrest inside of Russia. And so in the meantime, these contract soldiers uh, who refused, I got away with refusing to go to back to Ukraine. They had their military records, including their their uh, their personal uh, ID, uh, hit with a special stamp saying these men are unreliable, but they're not fired. <laughs> and that's just so we can identify those who basically uh, insisted they would not go into Ukraine unless it was a, a, a official war. The conscripts, of course, are always um, from the beginning as part of the uh, the early, you know, all volunteer army uh, <clears throat> uh, promise <clears throat> had the uh, their conscript uh, term reduced to one year. Now, they're called up twice a year. And I think the late, last one was in late, that last call up was in late, uh, I think it was in October of uh, 2021. And there were huge shortfalls. I mean, a lot of guys, you know, simply didn't show up. Others, you know, the parents had money and not many people have money in Russia anymore, paid bribes to officially, you know, uh, had their, their sons uh, declared, you know, physically or psychologically uh, 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 unable. Putin changed that by lowering the standards. I mean, he had already lowered the standards for for conscripts, uh, but now he's willing to take anybody or at least scare the uh, the refuseniks, as it were, uh, to uh, uh, to report for duty. But even if they, those that do report for duty and, and who are you know mentally and physically capable of undergoing any training at all, they get about a month maybe of training, and they're only used for uh, uh, tasks outside of uh, Ukraine uh, in order to free up the uh, the contract soldiers uh, who are eligible. But then again, a lot of them are getting the special stamp on the right day because they refuse to go. So he's got a huge shortage of manpower. Now, he's using a lot of artillery, but, you know, uh, he also has limits on how much artillery ammunition he has. Uh, that's why the uh, Ukrainians are making the case successfully, but belatedly, uh, to the, uh, the the laggard NATO uh, suppliers, especially the uh, United States, uh, Germany, and France, that if he gets the ammunition and the and the, and the additional mobile artillery he's promised, he can uh, basically go on the offensive uh, and and push the remaining Russians out. Now, the uh, the Ukrainians. Uh, have a lot of brigades, but they got a lot. I think it's a, a 1,200 kilometer front uh, to cover, uh, so it's not a continuously manned front. And if you if you poke through in one area, you got to be able to sustain it to make any grounds. Because what the what the Ukrainians have done is they've they've uh, they basically formed a mobile force. We've already reported on this in strategy page using pickup trucks and uh, ATVs, all terrain vehicles. They equip these with anti-tank or anti-aircraft weapons or heavy machine guns. The technical as it were, from from the uh, that various air regulars have been using for decades, um, to uh, you know rush in and basically go on the defensive. They're they're not for attacking. They're basically a mobile reserve. Now another problem <laughs> the, the Ukrainians are having is the Russians did get their act together with their uh, their their uh, how should I put it short short range anti-aircraft. Uh, equipment in in Donbass, and they the Ukrainians can no longer use the UAVs, especially their TB2s, the Turkish ones, freely because they get shot down now. Uh, but the Ukrainians, again, they're ever resourceful, and this is something uh, Putin doesn't like to remark on. The, the Ukrainians are not only out fighting the Russians, uh, they're out you know innovating, and they basically have their own UAVs. They build themselves. They were doing this, you know, after starting to do this after uh, 2014. These are small and very, they're very difficult to uh, catch, uh, but they still can basically send back a surveillance video uh, uh, of what's up there and, and still allow the, uh, the Ukrainians, if they have the artillery ammunition and the mobile artillery, 
to basically deliver accurate uh, counter battery fire. I believe I'm not sure of this. I believe the Ukra- Ukrainians are also asking for the ATK fuse. That's a um, a development which was used very successfully in uh, in Syria by a Marine uh, artillery battalion. They went in one battery at a time, and they basically fired thousands of these ATK uh, GPS uh, guided shells. They were accurate enough to let the Kurds basically drive the drive ISIL out of their their, their the cities in eastern uh, Syria. So the, the Ukrainians knew about this. Now, if they get the ATK, you know, fuses, which can be infused, uh, added to any shell, any any dumb, you know, uh, artillery shell, um, and used, uh, they again will have outsmarted the Russians. Now, the Russians are not only running out of manpower, but they're running out of no ideas. Uh, they were they've been trying for months to improve their anti-aircraft capabilities, uh, and the best they can do, which is something is to uh, develop the capability to knock down uh, larger uh, uh, UAVs, especially the ones carrying weapons. But that's not going to help them with the smaller ones. They're, they're not invisible. The only people who have a radar, uh, 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 an early warning system for that is Israel, which is, which is not sending anything like this to the Russians. Uh, of course, they're not sell- sending anything much to uh, Ukraine either, unless it's already licensed. Uh, uh, there are some things that are already licensed, built uh, in Ukraine, and also some of the NATO allies have uh, access to. Uh, uh, they buy Israeli weapons, especially the Spike anti-guided uh, uh, anti-tank guided missiles, which they just slip into Ukraine. You know, keep this quiet. Uh, the other problem is the Russians are running short of their ballistic missiles. Which are their key weapon in um, uh, in hitting uh, arms depots or shipments coming in from Poland uh, or uh, Slovakia and uh, Romania, and um, uh, these are basically at risk now uh, because the uh, the the Ukrainians have improvised and built a basically a, a version of Iron Dome. Now it's not as efficient as the uh, as the Israeli version. Uh, mainly they need faster computers and some help with the missiles, but they've been shooting down 20% of the, uh, of the Russian, you know, guided, you know, rockets as it were, uh, being used. So that's another area where the, the Russians are in trouble and they'll be in bigger trouble, uh, if the Ukrainians get any more equipment. Now, the Ukrainians also point out that the Russians are deliberately destroying the, uh, Ukrainian economy as much as possible, because that means there's no food, there's no utilities. And, you know, Ukraine needs billions to rebuild that. They also need a lot of money to improvise in the meantime. But mainly they need weapons to defeat the Russian weapons before they start, you know, seriously repairing all the damage. So Ukraine is down to, uh, is, Putin is down to his last set of excuses. Uh, if the Ukrainians stay ahead of him and uh, there, there's no pro- progress at all, they, they don't have enough ar- uh, artillery. The Russians use their artillery in mass, you know, in, in battalions, that's, you know, 12 or 18 guns uh, or uh, or brigades, which is, you know, two or three battalions. They mass their fire. That's why it's so devastating. But if the Ukrainians get these ATK fuses and more, uh, you know, uh, mobile artillery, uh, they will devastate the Russian artillery, whether they have more ammunition or not. So Putin's prospects, from what we know already, are not good. And if he ends up losing more territory in Ukraine, uh, and if the Ukrainians start closing in on Crimea, which <laughs> he pulled a clever scam you know, recently, they finally finished their 2020 census. They hold one every 10 years. And it was delayed by COVID and, and, and other things. Um, and he, and they, they pronounced that we have, we have, for the first time in 20 years, the population has increased. Well, that's only if you include the 2.3 million people in Crimea uh, who were basically made a part of Russia without much consent of the people. In fact, it's also known that uh, Russian efforts to conscript uh, troops in uh, Crimea and, uh, and Donbass have not worked out very well. Uh, a lot of the, uh, the, the people in, uh, in Crimea and um, and uh, Donbass are actively opposing efforts to get them into the military. They're closer to what's going on than any other Russians. 
and uh, and you know, again, you know, Putin's, you know, I, Putin's running out of excuses. If he, like I say, if he starts losing territory in a big way, <clears throat> he may come up with something. But you know, each excuse is less and less convincing, and the Russian people uh, already. Even though, you know, uh, you know, half the population, over half the population is out in rural areas where their only source of news is the state control. There's not a lot of Internet and what have you. People in the urban areas are very much opposed to the war because they have access to the, the Internet. They can basically get the, uh, the, the news feeds from the West and especially from Ukraine, which publishes a lot of information and pictures of the damage being done to the uh, Russian forces. And, um, uh, you know, if Putin loses uh, his ability uh, to deal with that, you know, he's toast. Uh, Now, you can't guarantee that because he's a survivor. But basically, he's painted himself into a burning corner. And (laughs) if the fire gets close enough, it's bye-bye Putin. And he won't be mourned uh, by a lot of people inside of Russia. Austin, do you see the same things that Jim is saying? Uh, ab- absolutely, Dan. I, the, the column I wrote this week about the Baltic news, where I uh, watched uh, what's gone on over the last, really, the last 10 days has been fascinating uh, as a diplomatic, the, the diplomatic dance there uh, and rhetorical dance of uh, threatening uh, uh, Lithuania. Uh, overtly uh, threatening Denmark <laughs> with the naval probes, also Estonia with uh, uh, illegal overflights and uh, the Estonians, uh, uh, who knows, maybe Russian intelligence did it to try to uh, scare them that, uh, that uh, the Russians were wargaming missile attacks uh, on Estonia. And we can just look at the <clears throat> photos and video of what <clears throat> those missiles do in mass to uh, uh, a uh, apartment blocks uh, to an, uh, a city, and uh, e- also uh, verbal sparring uh, with the Swedes, and and then it was interesting to see Finland's response to it. Uh, the chief of defense said that uh, the Finnish army, really the entire Finnish people, because they're a nation in arms, but he was talking about Finnish military forces, are built to fight them. The kind of war Russia is uh, trying to wage in uh, in Ukraine. Uh, Finns have uh, dispersed artillery, but also with a lot of of if if not uh, pinpoint smart shells. Uh, they've got a lot of, uh, of 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 targeting data because they know how they're going to. Uh, there are places the Russians will have to go. And they're they're covered, and then they've got these. Oh, it's not quite fair to call them defense zones. That sounds almost like two. You've constructed a, a, a fortresses, but they are. Uh, uh, they've got uh, bunkers, camp, uh, pre-built uh, camouflage positions, <clears throat> which you could ferret out from Russian intelligence. But they're mutually supporting, and they've got routes through uh, uh, throughout for fast uh, mobile forces. And then, of course, the terrain in the summer, you've got to slosh through the Arctic swamp. And in the winter, you've got all of the other constrictions dealing with the Danish, uh, I mean, with the Finnish uh, weather and, uh, and the snow. Uh, the, 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 the chief of defense's point was uh, we would be fighting winter war again, except with advanced artillery systems and uh, a, a fabulous air force and unspoken is what comes up it'll be occurring probably about the time this podcast comes out the uh, madrid uh, meeting of nato where finland wants to join now i am I'm, I'm, I'm coming at this from a, a diff- different angle th- than jim did but coming basically to the same conclusion russia now has what Another 810 mile front with NATO with uh, the uh, let's, I'm not overrating the Finns. You know, they've got what five and a half, six million people, but they they're prepared to fight. And uh, everybody, everybody knows it that pays any uh, pays any attention to. Them. That's part of the uh, whiplash, the boomerang of, of, uh, Ukra- of Putin's 
conventional attack on uh, uh, this year on, uh, on, on Ukraine, but it was already building after the invasion and annexation in uh, uh, February, March of 2014. Uh, everybody reawakened, almost everybody in, in, in Europe, and said, they're at it again. And uh, you started to see the Finns already moved over from, we can't be neutral. We really aren't neutral. Let's take the veil off. And the Swedish public, the barometer on that started moving towards, hey, uh, we know who our friends are. We're not going to get invaded by Norway, Denmark, Finland, United Kingdom, Canada, the United States, Poles. Uh Uh-uh. We know. We know who the trouble is. And as been the same trouble uh, throughout the Cold War. Now, this doesn't put internal domestic pressure on Putin per se, but it does, you know, Kaliningrad has been turned into this, you know, a mighty fortress by uh, uh, Russia. Uh, it, it's the exclave used to be Königsberg. Uh, I cover some of the history in in that column, but it's commented upon in numerous places in strategy pages uh, 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 files that uh, it's out there. It's uh, an imperial treasure from uh, World War II. And at the same time, even in what was it, 2017, 2018, uh, Kremlin was concerned about possible Germanization, is the term they used, of Kaliningrad. Therefore, they've got the, the, the secret police operating against anybody that wants to talk about uh, old Königsberg. Uh, it's, there's a noose around it. It was supposed to be this forward threat, and it's got nuclear weapons in it. The Lithuanians say they have that, that uh, they know that for sure, and the Latvians say that, which tells me that NATO knows exactly where they are. Forward-based forces, but really what it is is isolated. And here's another boomerang, Dan. By invading and annexing Crimea, Russia violated what was understood to be the deal after World War II, is that you don't use military forces to invade, take territorial, and then, uh, and then annex it. Uh, you, you, there can be territorial adjustments, but we're going to do it legally by honest plebiscite or uh, buying something. That's that's not done in any of the treaties, but that would be that would be uh, uh, acceptable, and that isn't that isn't the way the Russians handled it. So if, if you can take Crimea, who's to say? And I'm not I'm not uh, this is not going to happen. But uh, someone decides they want to take Kaliningrad. Now, who would the someone be? I'm being fantasy here because really what you see going on is a tyrant's projection about what he would do if he had the power to take a place like that. And so he presumes that uh, uh, that NATO and the Baltic nations, the United States, Germany, Poland uh, would would take it. Now, I, all right, I've talked up that is just a small piece of a larger piece. I see desperation, really out of the Kremlin. Don't hear much about that, but take a look at some of the actions. As Jim said, and he, Jim talked about tactical and operational, a little bit of the strategic uh, issues when he got into the demographics of trying to raise troops. Uh, and they, I'm sorry, they can't raise troops when they, they've got uh, a limited number to be uh, uh, of trained personnel to begin with. But it, what appears to me and I, I've read this, it could be speculative, wrong, and the other, but the Russians don't have their heart in this war. So he's got, he's got a morale issue there. Jim touched on that. But take a look at how, what his ideas are for carrying on a war. Blockade Ukrainian grain, already doing that, and getting a backlash globally because of the food shortages that are cropping up already in the Middle East, North Africa. And I tell you, it is going to really hurt East and Central Africa, uh, African countries, because, you know, they're the trickle-down uh, food supplies. Uh, it's, 
and that's to say also about uh, energy costs and non um, oil producing or uh, nations. Now that's not quite the way to put it, but they're, they they rely on outside sources for uh, uh, fuel uh, and, and, and energy. Yeah, he's hoping that that leads to the oil and, ga- and gas diplomacy that he still thinks may bail him out with uh, Western Europe. But is it gonna it gonna happen? You have the Germans turning around and thinking, well. Even the German Greens, I mean, you talk about a, a boomerang. We're going to have to use coal. Maybe we must rely on nuclear power because they look over at France and uh, 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 France's situation. Now, so what is he, what's the other uh, op- uh, part, uh, part of this? Because it's the home front where the, uh, the, the Putin is, is vulnerable. Uh, oppression, silencing all opposition. That's not new. Uh, has it worked? He, he certainly, when I said, I don't think the Russians have their heart in this war, we know the Ukrainians do. Uh, boy, have we seen that. Have, have we seen that? What's he going to do if it's just sullen opposition of the Russians during uh, the Cold War? They pretend to pay us and we pretend to work. Now, that's... Uh, not direct, directly the same thing, but it's like uh, we're uh, we're giving up. Uh, I, I also made one other note uh, that I, uh, on uh, of, of of some thoughts on this, but I'll hold it until and get Jim's feedback on what I just said. Jim, you got any more comments? Yes, on the on June eighteenth, uh, Lithuania which basically uh, 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 is controls all the land uh, entrances to Kaliningrad, uh, declared an embargo citing the uh, sanctions against Russia. And they halted all rail and uh, road uh, traffic into Kaliningrad, which has a population of nearly half a million. Now, it's, uh, it's uncertain how many soldiers are in there. It's at least 10,000, might be as many as 100,000 or more. But... These guys need food. Now, they can supply about half their needs by sea, but the Lithuanians are asking for other NATO nations to impose a naval blockade, uh, which is, again, part of the sanctions already against uh, Russia. Now, if they do that, (laughs) Kaliningrad is in big trouble. Now, if the Russians try anything, like Austin said, they have nukes, but they might also have 100,000 troops. The population of Kaliningrad has gone up uh, considerably since... uh, 2014. It used to be, you know, about 400, you know, 20,000, 50,000. Now it's way over that. And it's believed that many of the additional troops, uh, additional population are, are soldiers, which the Russians don't want to declare. Um, but if, if the, if the, uh, if the land, you know, bar- embargo uh, is, uh, you know, uh, is holds and there's a, a naval embargo as well, they're getting nothing. Uh, and they can, you know, they can, you know, they can negotiate for humanitarian food aid. Uh, but, you know, uh, if, they, if they try and fight, they uh, they trigger Article 5. And they're officially at war with uh, NATO. Now, they're already talking about that, that NATO is really behind all this. That's another, uh, you know, bit of the uh, the Putin myth. He's been he's been spouting this. Uh, oh, since mm, Jesus, I, well, I think he did, did this in the. Uh, 2008, when he invaded tiny Georgia in the Caucasus, and basically, in effect, the next two portions of it that were not uh, occupied by uh, uh, ethnic Georgians. Um, And uh, one of the reasons for invading uh, Georgia was they wanted to join NATO, and they still want to uh, join NATO. (laughs) Uh, So that's another pending application. Uh, Of course, the Russians are getting uh, help from the Turks, uh, who, um, who are basically vetoing for the moment the uh, Finnish and Swedish applications that join NATO uh, because they feel, I think it's only the Swedes uh, gave um, uh, sanctuary to uh, Kurds, uh, uh, to, you know, basically Kurds who basically opposed, uh, you know, uh, Turkish uh, violence against Kurds in, in, uh, in Syria. The, Kur- uh, the Kurdish uh, uh, workers 
party, you know, the PKK. Well, they, yeah, they claim in, Sweden in, in Turkey as well. Yeah. Uh, and uh, nobody's, ever gotten, nobody's ever gotten away with, uh, you know, stopping that. Um, and uh, so that's at a stalemate right now. Basically, I think the latest, uh, latest uh, status of that is the Swedes have told of the pound sand. I mean, first, the, uh, uh, the, the Kurds said, uh, the Turks said, well, we'll allow Finland because they're not, they're not basically harboring these terrorists by the Turkish definition. Um, uh, but the Swedes have basically said, you know, well, the Finns said either both of us get in or, or none of us get in. Now, another embarrassment for Turkey, this is appropriate, um, is that uh, they wanted to make peace with a lot of the people they've made, er, 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 President Erdogan. Uh, he wants to make peace with a lot of the uh, the Arab and Western nations that he's turned into enemies, including Israel. And he started with the UAE, and the UAE was holding one of their uh, senior uh, MIT. That's the uh, the uh, Turkish CIA. And for years, they've been running uh, 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 groups that basically recruit Islamic terrorists that are favorable, are willing to take orders, as it were. And these are the ones that are, are basically uh, controlling a lot of the, uh, the Idlib province in northern, in northern Syria, which, uh, which the Turks don't want to accept all of it. There's about oh, a million, close to a million uh, of these um, Islamic terrorists and their families uh, uh, trapped in Idlib. Uh, Turkey has fortified its border. They will not allow all of them into Turkey. They might allow a certain, you know, a, a, number of them, uh, but the rest are basically condemned to death because once once uh, Syria, which is basically using Russia, still using some Russian air power uh, to attack the, uh, you know, the, uh, the Islamic terrorists in the uh, whenever they take an area, they basically start rounding up the usual suspects and they disappear. So the um, uh, the the uh, the people in, uh, in Idlib province have, have a lot to worry about. And it's all because of the uh, the Turkish attitude towards the, uh, the the Kurdish separatists, not just the PKK, who definitely want to uh, oh yeah, they're, they're uh, not, you know, a, a right. separate Kurdistan yeah. using a hard large chunk of uh, southeastern Turkey. As but the other uh, 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 Kurds in Iraq, for example, are happy to just have autonomy, which they've had since the mid 1990s. Um, and the uh, and basically the uh, the Kurds in uh, Syria who uh, who control most of Hasaka province, which is adjacent to uh, uh, to uh, the autonomous uh, uh, Kurdish area in Iraq, are negotiating with the Assads for the same thing. The, uh, now the Assads, as much as they hate to do this, they're willing, you know, to let the uh, the Kurds have the same kind of autonomy uh, because they are much better fighters than the Arab troops, and they have American air support. Uh, so. Uh, you know the uh, the uh, the Russians are are running out of you know ways to uh, to militarize uh, their uh, their efforts uh, to hang on in uh, in Ukraine. Uh, the Turks like to help them because you know basically the uh, the, the the Turks and the Russians are are ancient enemies, um, and uh, the Turks basically have all they've gotten out of the Russians so far. Uh, some uh, some illegal grain shipments. Now, some of those have been seized when they were basically taken outside of the Black Sea because they were basically stolen uh, from Ukrainian ports. Uh, but the Russians are also willing, uh, if they can get, you know, open up the uh, uh, the river, uh, what is it, Donet, the Donets River, uh, which basically uh, funnels most of the, uh, the traffic, uh, the grain uh, supplies and what have you. Uh, to uh, to uh, a, a Ukrainian port uh, from whence they are shipped worldwide. Uh, the Ukrainians really only are responsible for about 12 percent of the these exportable grain. The Russians are responsible for 28 uh, percent, and but uh, you know 18 by, by 18, the majority of it. But they can't get it out because they don't they don't completely control uh, the Black Sea uh, and and Kershon, uh, the area where the they do they did take early on is under the one area that's under constant attack by the Ukrainians because they realize that they can take that. Uh, they got the Russian, you know, grain exports uh, where they want them, as it were. In other words, not moving out of Russia. And it's up to Russia uh, to make a move and get the heck out of Ukraine. So you can see it's one thing after another as far as Putin's concerned. 
And again, he continues blaming it all on NATO. You know, for you know, for you know, fifteen years at least, he's been saying NATO's NATO's at war with us. Well, and and, he, and a lot of Russians are catching on to the fact that NATO is a defensive organization. You basically, and a lot of Russians don't like to admit this, but you you join NATO, especially the Eastern European countries, uh, in order to uh, gain some more protection from a Russian attack. Uh, again, you know, for a long time, especially during the right after the Cold War, you know, Russians didn't want to admit that they were the bad guys. Uh, but now it's dawning on them that nobody wants to attack them. They just don't want to be attacked by Russia. And, uh, you know, things are not looking good for Putin. You know, his house of cards, his house of illusions is unraveling. And he's basically running out of uh, bits and pieces uh, to uh, to keep it, you know, going. So there it is. Long term or even short term. You know, uh, unless there's a major, you know, uh, how should I put it, uh, shutdown of support from the the big three, the United States, Germany, and France, uh, the, the the Ukrainians are going to, you know, fight their way uh, to total liberation from Russia. I mean, they're still, willing- it's still going to be a long, bloody exactly, uh, and 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 and, 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 and war to do that, and and American and 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 military leaders in uh, in France. Uh, Germany and the United States point out to the to the to their political leaders that if we basically stonewall supplies for the Ukrainians and they take a lot more casualties doing what they're going to do anyway, they're never going to forget. And that's going to be a political problem for those three countries. I, I, and, I agree. I, I, and, 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 and the political leaders are saying, well, maybe we don't want to be on the wrong side. Of this. So basically supplies, especially from the United States, are speeding up. And I think the Germans have started shipping, you know, the, the tanks and the, uh, uh, and the and the mobile artillery, you know, and the ammunition that the uh, the Ukrainians want. So really, it's it's a it's a war of perceptions as well as realities. And and I think the the Ukrainians have convinced the world that they are never going to give up. I mean, Zelensky, you know, will always be noted as you know the the Slavic Churchill. Uh, he will fight to fight to the very end. And of course, before America, you know, joined the war because the, uh, you know, the, the the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, and the and the Germans didn't have to declare war, but Hitler said, ah, the Americans, uh, and he declared war anyway. And bingo, you know, that was the end of the road for the eventually in a couple of years uh, for the uh, for the Germans. The Russians are in the same situation, and uh, that's why they have actively tried to assassinate Zelensky. So. <laughs> He's basically a frontline fighter, but of course, he recently visited the front lines in uh, in the in the east in the uh, in the Donbas and handed out awards, had pictures taken, boom, 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 and then disappeared back to uh, Kiev, where he's better guarded. So you know the the Russians are are, are losing that battle as well, uh, but I don't think they'll give up on getting uh, Zelensky, uh, even if they are driven out of all of Ukraine. I mean. The Russians do have a tendency to hold a grudge for a long, long time. Dan, I think I can. Uh, I've got a way of expressing uh, in a in uh, one sentence a soundbite. Okay. A lot of things Jim and I were talking about. Russia wasn't prepared to fight a long war, and there's a lot of illusions and delusions that's uh, that led them to take that uh, uh, action they took. That, that quick strike uh, on on uh, Kiev and it failed, but they weren't prepared for it. And all the things that Jim uh, Jim and I've been talking about feed uh, feed into that. They convinced themselves they could do something, and were prepared to do something, and had the power to do something that they cannot do. Well, we'll end it there. Uh, thanks, and we'll talk to you guys next time. Take care, guys. Take care.